Hello and welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. I'm Naomi Fowler. This month, the Tax Justice Network released its brand new Corporate Tax Haven Index. Any country can look at the methodology and then understand what are the measures that they should be taking to improve their own country's laws and also to prevent any abuses or any tax avoidance from hurting them, but also preventing their own countries from becoming corporate tax havens. We'll dive straight into the results and what they tell us about how to fix the global economy and the international tax system. So let's head straight over to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this new index. Right, John, we've had the Corporate Tax Haven Index out this month. What are the key things that people should take away as a result of this index? What does it tell us? I think it provides one of those really rare glimpses of what actually happens underneath the bonnet of the global economy. It tells a very disturbing story, or rather several disturbing stories. So I'm going to take three points out of, out of the index. Headline number one relates to the question of who are the, you know, the villains of the story. No less than four British territories rank in the top ten of the Corporate Tax Haven Index, and that's an appalling figure. British Virgin Islands comes first, then Bermuda, then Cayman. Jersey comes in at number seven. And of course you've also got the Bahamas, which is a member of the Commonwealth, all in the top ten. Now, none of this has happened by accident, and British law firms, British banks, British accountants, British government officials in Whitehall, in Tortola, Hamilton and, you know, Jameson and St Helier all have played a part in what we can only describe as a full frontal assault on the national tax sovereignty of every other country on the planet. That's what they're doing. They're attacking the tax regimes of other countries. So that's, for me, is the top headline. But then you have the second headline, and that relates to the wider role of Europe in supporting tax havens, because in the top ten, again, you have Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland comes in just outside the top ten, all feature at the very top of the rankings. If you add Britain and its tax haven uh, cluster, what we see is a clear pattern. Europe is right at the forefront of the tax wars. That is, the tax wars attacking the tax regimes of other countries. Now, that's something I think the European Union needs to recognise, that it has responsibilities in this area and it must take radical steps now to block corporate tax avoidance and these abusive tax regimes. And then thirdly, we have the very ugly story, and this is a story that has been hidden until relatively recently, of how major countries, and I'm talking here particularly about Britain and France, They've been at the forefront of using their very considerable political power to push for extremely favourable withholding tax rates in double taxation treaties. Right, and withholding tax being the tax deducted at source before that money leaves the country. That's right. Think of withholding tax as a protective measure which allows developing countries in particular to tax capital before it is repatriated as dividends to the resident country of the multinational company. So it's an important protection against tax avoidance. But France and Britain have been pushing very aggressively indeed for favourable double tax treaties, conditions where the rates, and we look at it here in in the Corporate Tax Haven Index, on average the rates are considerably lower than those for other countries. And if we take, for example, uh, France, the average rate of withholding tax that they are negotiating is a full 8% lower than the average for the rest of the world. In other words, they're using their political muscle to get favourable treatment. Now, when you think about that, these double tax treaties, because they're giving favourable tax treatment to French multinational companies, this is creating a distortion, very much to the disadvantage of the source countries, in other words, the poorer countries, and very much to the advantage of French multinational companies. And this is a a massive global tax distortion. So if we sum up the Corporate Tax Haven Index, it's like a deep dive into the the hidden machinery of the global economy. It's extremely complex because it draws upon so many different issues. But what it reveals is is a really disturbing picture of international failure. We see the powerful European countries, and especially Britain, lying behind their clusters of tax havens, and they have wrecked economies across the world, 
and are now threatening social stability and democracy across the world. OK, let's talk about the actual state of negotiations now on the global tax system, because things are moving and it's really interesting what's going on. There was a G20 summit this month where they discussed reforms of the global tax system. And these are reforms which would have been absolutely unthinkable five years ago. And we've seen the European Union with a kind of a failed digital tax proposal of their own. India has really got fed up of this whole situation. Like uh, many other countries, the OECD is not doing what it wants to see. And uh, they have actually moved things along very fast and put a lot of pressure on the OECD and on the G20 by basically laying out, uh, I think, an 84-page proposal on how they intend to keep the taxes within their country where they should be taxed. And that is putting a lot of pressure on the entire system, isn't it? Lighting a fire, in fact. Well, look, you're absolutely right to say this situation simply could not have been foreseen five years ago. When the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development launched its Base Erosion Profit Shifting Programme, that's the famous BEPS programme, back in 2012, they expected that this would renew the uh, the former ta- international tax regime, which was based on the separate entity principle and the arm's length method, and they expected that, that would renew it for the 21st century. But that just hasn't happened. By the time the OECD reported back on BEPS in 2015, it was clear that what they had achieved was, one, an increase in complexity, and secondly, uh, potentially, uh, you know, they, they were multiplying the potential for tax disputes between countries by an exponential factor. In other words, it just wasn't going to work. And they clearly hadn't found a solution which would work for the digitised economy of the 21st century. So uh, I think countries across the world have now recognised this. So what we have now is a major and and politically powerful country like India. India's a G20, a member of the the group of 20 countries. That's the body which sets the rules and which requires the OECD to amend the, the rules. India's decided to light a fire under the previous rule book. And effectively they're saying these rules don't work for us, so think again. And meantime, we'll work according to our own rules. Now, that's a very, very powerful threat coming from such an important country as India. So the last thing the big multinational companies, particularly the US companies, want is to be faced with a fragmented tax rule. That is, different countries operating different rules. It it makes it much, much more complex and, and increases the possibility of having protracted tax disputes going on for years and years and years with lots of different countries disputing over taxing rights. So at the G20 meeting this June, it was clear that countries want to avoid this fragmentation and the pressure is now on the OECD to identify a proper and multilateral solution to this problem, which frankly has been vexing the liberal international order since the 1930s. Close on a century. So if we look at... The bigger picture here, what we're witnessing is an extraordinary moment in what I I would call the political economy of globalisation. After decades of inaction, governments are finally taking steps to rectify the very major fault line in the global architecture. So powerful non-OECD countries like India, but remember there's also China and Brazil and many African countries, they're all taking the driving seat here. They've lit the fires Everyone recognises that a a multilateral solution is much more desirable than a fragmented unilateral approach, but they are threatening unilateral approaches until a multilateral solution is worked up. I also think there's a recognition that the old hegemonic powers that shaped the rules to begin with, and here we're talking about Europe and North America, they're no longer powerful enough to impose a global framework of rules that works for them, but not for the rest of the world. So we're entering a fascinating moment where the geopolitics of international taxation are shifting. And the companies themselves want this change now because it seems like even the Googles and the Apples are going to the US government and saying, do something here because this is not a situation that we want anymore. 
let's, let's not be too sympathetic to these big multinational companies, particularly the American ones, because they've been at the very forefront of the, some of the most aggressive tax stuff. So I have no sympathy for Facebook and Amazon and, no, and no. Google. They're, they're really bad I'm players. Not but what's that been sympathetic? <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> but I mean, the important thing here is, of course, is not just India that's taken umbrage at this. Britain, of course, introduced a Google tax quite a few years ago, and France and uh, Italy and other countries are, are on this. But when a country like India says, no, that's it, it doesn't work for us, we're going our own way, then it gets very serious indeed, and the G20 simply cannot afford to ignore this any longer. So the road is open for the next steps, and of course the next steps are going to take us in the direction that Tax Justice Network has always been talking about, and that is in the direction of proper apportionment of profits to the countries where the profits are aligned with the economic substance. In other words, we're moving towards unitary taxation and formula apportionment. Right, and that is dividing everything up in terms of the actual economic substance of what companies are doing and where they're doing it, which seems blindingly obvious as a solution, which makes one wonder why it's taken so long and been so painful. And it takes India to you know, wave their hands in the air and uh, show this, these proposals, which seem to have moved things along much faster than any other country. Well, that's right. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, tax is a very, very political subject. And if we go back to the 1930s and the discussion for the League of Nations, there were many economists there who were saying the logical way of taxing multinational companies, which were, of course, new, they were emerging, it's an emerging phenomenon, the logical way of taxing them is on the basis of economic substance. In other words, on the basis of their sales, where their sales happen, on the basis of where they employ labour, on the basis of where their real capital is actually invested. But that wasn't the way it went, and it didn't go that way, largely, one suspects, because the big imperial powers that dominated the world, both politically and economically at that time, here we're talking about, again, the United Kingdom and France and Europe and North America, they didn't want the source countries of the South, their colonies, having taxing rights. So they used their political power to shape a tax regime very much in the favour of the resident countries of the North. But that hegemony is breaking up, and I think we should all welcome the breaking up of that power and welcome the opportunity now to create a framework for taxing multinational companies that suits the entire world, not just the most powerful countries in the world. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. So, as we were saying earlier, this month the Tax Justice Network released a brand new index, the Corporate Tax Haven Index. We're going to dig down into the results and what they tell us about the global economy. It's not pretty, but there are clear ways forward. Because of the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index, the world knows which countries and jurisdictions are the biggest offenders when it comes to secrecy levels, the places the very wealthy, the despots and the criminals like to use. Multinational companies like a bit of secrecy too, but they also like shopping around for the lowest tax rates and handy regulatory loopholes. So which jurisdictions offer them the lowest bargain basement deals. That's what the new Corporate Tax Haven Index looks at. So come with me to the Corporate Tax Haven supermarket to see what multinationals are shopping for. OK, so I've got my trolley or my cart and we're off. <laughs> Now, as a multinational business, we're going to want a jurisdiction with the lowest possible available corporate income tax rate that we can shuffle all our profits through. Hmm. Oh, look, I can get 0% in the Cayman Islands. Great, I'll have a bit of that. Thanks, that's scanned. Please place it in the bagging area. And, you know, it's not a good look if people know about it, so we want to be able to hide the details. Oh, that jurisdiction doesn't make our financial affairs available to foreign tax authorities. That's handy. This lot here, though, only gets us to do occasional public country-by-country -country reporting on the business we actually do and where. Hmm. Oh, but look, this jurisdiction doesn't make us do that ever, so we can keep it all to ourselves. Thanks. That's scanned. Please place it in the bagging area. Oh, look, this one's good. If we cook up some nice big losses... They'll let us carry it forward so we can cut our taxable profits to zero for the next 10 years. Lovely. I'll have one of those. 
Ah, in Mauritius, though, they let us dodge capital gains tax. Hmm, that's handy. Oh, but look, these jurisdictions all have special export zones. So if we use that to shuffle our money out and back in again, to dress it up to look like investment, we get a 10-year tax holiday. And it looks like we can get some other credits and sweeties too. Like it, like it. Ah, but this country over here, they've got a really nice patent box regime. Mm, don't you just love intellectual property related income? Mm. The thing is, as that little shopping trip shows, However many responsible governments there might be out there trying to tax multinationals fairly and legislate the way they do business fairly, there are other jurisdictions overriding their rules and undercutting their tax rates. And so legislation, tax rates, rules and laws become meaningless. That's the race to the bottom we're all in. And eventually we all lose. Companies find it quite easy to find the best deals in different jurisdictions. Andres Nobel of the Tax Justice Network. They don't actually have to go anywhere or hire anyone specifically to go and visit them. Big four accountancy firms already publish a list of the tax rates, the nominal tax rates that apply to companies in most countries. And many jurisdictions also offer and publish reports or brochures about why someone should go and set up a company there. So what would happen is that most companies, especially multinationals, would have their lawyers and accountants that would be based where the headquarters of the company is. And these lawyers and accountants would likely have allies or associate partners located in those jurisdictions. So once a company decides where they want to go, they would then either hire through their lawyers or accountants someone who is already based in that jurisdiction to explain exactly how a company should be set up and what the actual benefits will be. But again, there's enough information from lawyers or big four accountancy firms already as to which countries are already offering the best deals in terms of tax rates, low tax rates, or low regulation to attract companies to go and settle there. And there are so many of those armies of lawyers and accountants and other enabler professions, salespeople really, for tax and regulation dodging. Let's take a look at the ranking according to this new 2019 Corporate Tax Haven Index. It looks at 20 indicators to assess which jurisdictions most aggressively help the world's multinationals dodge tax and regulations. It then combines that score with their size as a global player. And so, the top 10 are... Coming in at number one, the British Virgin Islands, a British territory. Number two, Bermuda, a British territory. Number three, the Cayman Islands, a British territory. Number four, the Netherlands. Number five, Switzerland. Number six, Luxembourg. Number seven, Jersey, British dependency. Number eight, Singapore. Number nine, the Bahamas. And number 10, Hong Kong. Those 10 jurisdictions alone are responsible for over half of the world's corporate tax avoidance risks. And before we go any further, here's an important point on how we talk and think about these jurisdictions from Marcus Meinzer of the Tax Justice Network, director of the Corporate Tax Haven Index Research. I think it is important to point out that a term of tax haven has done us a big disservice for many decades now that is used instead of what we think is much more accurate nowadays instead of claiming a spectrum of secrecy a spectrum of tax havenness each country now embodies we have to be more specific than just tax havens there are so many dimensions to this and that is why we prefer to speak on the one hand about secrecy jurisdictions, whenever we refer to the elements that enable illicit financial flows related to tax evasion of, of individuals, of corruption and money laundering, money stemming from illegal trade in drugs, weapons or human beings. These kind of phenomena are usually closely associated and related to financial secrecy. And this is where 
we prefer to speak of secrecy jurisdictions. And the Financial Secrecy Index is capturing those phenomena. And the other element that we need to complement this terminology is the corporate tax haven, which designates those places that play a more important role for multinationals in shifting their profits across borders. And this is why we have complemented the Financial Secrecy Index with the Corporate Tax Haven Index. It um, is again spelling out in 20 indicators in five categories very clearly and precisely what we are measuring and why we are measuring this, indicating how much a country contributes to the problem of tax avoidance or in the case of Financial Secrecy Index, to the problem of global financial secrecy and the associated illicit financial flows. The Corporate Tax Haven Index and the Financial Secrecy Index paint a different picture, much more nuanced, where we can see that many countries nowadays have joined the bandwagon, have joined the race to the bottom, and have now taken on themselves policies that qualify as providing financial secrecy to non-residents or as providing tax avoidance opportunities for businesses operating from outside of the jurisdiction and uh, being controlled from outside the jurisdiction. If we want to avoid the pitfalls of the last decades that led to the status quo in fighting tax havens, meaning that there was no progress or very little progress, we have to overcome the terminology of tax havens. This will only support the populist and symbolic policies against places that will not make a difference if they are closed down while ignoring the big elephants in the room, such as the UK network, such as Netherlands and corporate tax havenry, or the United States in terms of financial secrecy. So, in other words, there are elements of the laws in every country which are problematic, whether those are secrecy elements or low tax offerings or regulatory loopholes. It hurts everyone in the end but some pay more than others. Liz Nelson of the Tax Justice Network's Human Rights Research Team. The Corporate Tax Haven Index shows us it's generally wealthier countries gaining at the expense of poorer countries. Tax competition between nations, or tax wars, hits hardest the people in society who are already vulnerable to social, political and economic insecurities. Women, children, people with disabilities, indigenous people and other minority groups. They're the first in line who will experience greater extremes of deprivation and discrimination because they rely most on essential services. When governments don't have the tax revenues they really need, they can't fulfil their human rights obligations to their citizens. That's a human tragedy. It's not just lost opportunities for individuals, but for whole nations. And it's also something that affects entire regions that are the least able to bear the costs. Shanna Lima from the Corporate Tax Haven Index research team. Research shows that the losses in revenues from corporate tax avoidance are much more intense in developing countries than in higher income countries. And the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean estimates that the losses with tax evasion amount to more than 6% of the GDP of the region. Now, Latin American countries cannot afford these losses, especially in the recent years as many countries are suffering with large public deficits and are undertaking major cuts in social programs and in public services to try to solve their fiscal problems. Many of these social programs had a central role in reducing poverty and inequality in Latin American countries in in the last decade, and they are much more needed now as poverty and inequality started to rise again in the region. And despite improvements of the last decade, Latin America is still the most unequal region of the world, which makes it even more important to tackle corporate tax avoidance and assure revenues for social spending. Some countries are actively preying on poorer, less powerful parts of the world, negotiating tax deals with them to benefit their companies, which they never agree to themselves. Rachel Etapoya from the Corporate Tax Haven Index research team is based in Malawi. Our latest research, the Corporate Tax Haven Index, reveals which of the richest countries and former colonial powers are the biggest enemy to former colonies and developing countries. This is undermining African governments' abilities to tax multinational companies, and in turn it means that African citizens were forced to pay more taxes on our income, more taxes on our basic 
food items and on services. And of course, the most vulnerable in our societies end up shouldering the biggest burden of taxation. It also means that our governments are forced to borrow money or rely on aid from some of the very same corporate tax havens that are lining their pockets as a result of tax avoidance. France and the UK, for example, are identified in the corporate tax haven index as the most aggressive OECD countries towards low, lower income and low middle income countries. Take France, for example, it secures some of the largest reductions in withholding tax with its former colonies, Burkina Faso, Niger and Togo. So, former colonial powers are being quite ruthless in enabling multinationals to profit shift out of former colonies, places of occupation. But the pain isn't all being inflicted by powerful and wealthy outsiders. Some governments in some of the world's most unequal regions are hurting themselves and their own populations too by offering multinationals crazy deals that really aren't serving them. Shana Lima again. The corporate tax have an index brings concrete policy recommendations through its 20 qualitative indicators that reflect what we believe should be the policies for improving transparency, measures to close loopholes and gaps in tax laws and anti-avoidance measures. These policy recommendations can be used by Latin American countries to improve their own regulations. One of the loopholes and gaps assessed by the index is the provision of exemptions and preferential tax treatments to certain types of companies, sectors or in certain geographical regions. Now, Latin America has a history of widely using these exemptions, justifying them on the basis of attracting investments and fostering economic activity. However, there is no assurance that they will attract investments. In fact, research shows that these incentives are often ineffective in attracting foreign direct investment and they end up resulting in significant losses of revenues. According to some estimates, these tax incentives have caused losses of up to 30% of the revenues collected from corporate tax in some Latin American countries. So countries in the region may want to rethink these policies to help increase their revenues and tackle their fiscal problems. Corporate Tax Haven Index research team member Rachel Etapoya agrees. What we've found is that African governments have granted many sectoral exemptions and tax holidays. These are usually costly and contrary to popular opinion, they usually fail to attract additional desirable investment. Our governments would be much better off raising taxes to pay for better roads and energy provision because these conditions, like good infrastructure and rule of law, are more decisive for investors than tax incentives. And they're also a prerequisite for ensuring investment schemes are effective. This is shown time and again in investment climate surveys, yet governments still award tax incentives, reducing the revenue they're able to collect. So what can African countries do? What, what needs to happen regionally? As Tax Justice Network Africa has done, it's been fighting to prevent the Kenyan government from entering a double taxation agreement with the Mauritian government because a lot of these double tax treaties are used by companies to shift their profits offshore, to shift them away from where the resources are being extracted, where most of the business activity is happening, where most of the people are employed. So that's the first step. Let's check and not enter into these agreements. There are also some specific anti-avoidance measures that could be adopted to reduce the risk of profit shifting. You can improve the rules around withholding tax, and make sure that multinationals cannot deduct interest royalties and certain savings payments from their tax base if they pay to other subsidiaries of the same multinational. At the national level, the Corporate Tax Haven Index shows that there are improvements that can be made in transparency in African countries to enable tax authorities to have the necessary information they need to be able to carry out audits and to investigate companies further. This includes requiring companies to submit accounts and making these publicly accessible, requiring companies to report on a country by country basis and to file these reports locally so the governments can find out where the company is booking its profits and paying taxes. Governments can also introduce rules that require companies or tax advisors to report any tax avoidance schemes that they may have used or sold or to report on certain tax positions. And public access is also really vital. Journalists, citizens need to know what's going on. It can also improve accountability of multinationals and also of government institutions. So we need to see tax courts 
being open to the public, decisions being public, any tax rulings that governments enter into or issue for multinationals need to be public. Mining contracts, petroleum contracts, these all need to be in the public domain and freely accessible. Andres Nobel of the Corporate Tax Haven Index team. For short, the CTHI. What these countries could be doing now is look at the CTHI, look at the ranking, and then start taking measures to prevent any harm from those countries on the top of the CTHI ranking. This means that they can also look into the countries with which they hold most trade relations, foreign direct investment relations, or other types of, of relations, and then realize which are the countries that may be creating the most harm or the most risk to their own tax revenues. Additionally, any country can look at the methodology of the CTHI, look at the 20 indicators, and then understand what are the measures that they should be taking to improve their own country's laws and also to prevent any abuses or any tax avoidance from hurting them. This can be in terms of transparency, in terms of having the right anti-avoidance provisions, but also preventing their own countries from becoming corporate tax havens. The Netherlands is a nation that's got plenty to do in that area. It's ranked number four in the corporate tax haven index. Here's Marcus Mines there again. Countries that want to take action to improve their score can quickly check through our country profiles where their score is worse and where they can do most to improve their ranking. Often, for example, in case of Netherlands, you see that its uh, double tax treaty category, category number five, is not the most aggressive one. Maybe the most problematic one is the corporate income tax rate in Netherlands, the lowest available corporate income tax rate, which is heavily pulled down through the practice of unilateral secretive tax rulings issued by the tax administrations to individual corporate taxpayers, where we cannot know unless there's in-depth investigations by the European Union in very few cases, a handful of cases, where we cannot know otherwise what taxes the corporations are indeed paying. And remedying this, abolishing unilateral corporate tax rulings, for example, or for a start making them all public, so as we can assess what rates are being given and granted in those rulings, would be probably the single most important and effective way for Netherlands to improve its core and to reduce its impact it creates through its corporate tax system for the rest of the world. One question that gets asked a lot, considering the United States is number two in the Financial Secrecy Index, is why isn't the United States higher in the ranking of the Corporate Tax Haven Index, where it's ranked 25th? Corporate Tax Haven Index team member Lucas Narotsky. First of all, we are not measuring the same things because the United States is a good secrecy jurisdiction, somewhere where you can go hide your assets. does not mean that it is a good tax haven for corporations in particular. The Financial Secrecy Index covers also different kinds of entities that are not corporations, such as partnerships and trusts. So the regulations that the United States has with regards to these entities worsens the score of the United States in the Financial Secrecy Index. However, the new index integrates certain aspects of financial secrecy in one of its five pillars that is dedicated to the transparency of uh, public company accounts uh, to country by country reporting or tax court secrecy. This is only one of five components in the corporate tax haven index and the United States scores pretty bad in this component with 77 out of 100. So when it comes to secrecy levels and secrecy indicators, the United States scores badly in both indexes. But this is why we need to understand and target the different unhealthy elements of secrecy and corporate tax havenry offerings of every country. The Tax Justice Network has always argued that unitary tax is the obvious, fairer way to go to make sure corporations are taxed on the basis of where they're doing their business on where their sales happen, on where they employ people, and on the basis of where their real capital is actually invested. Every two years, the Tax Justice Network team will assess countries for the Corporate Tax Haven Index, just like with the Financial Secrecy Index. To read all about the Corporate Tax Haven Index and see how your country's ranked and what can be done about it, go to www.corporatetaxhavenindex.org.
Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month.